Pacha Patch. Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee One, and joining me, as always, via the Skype over the interweb from way out in Nassau County, it's John. And we're in it, man. We're in it. We're getting to the bread and butter right now. The heavy dirt. Yeah. She's just capitalizing on her <sighs> poor decisions. And now each poor decision that she makes, or selfish decision that she makes, is just increased exponentially. Because of passport decisions. Just building one on top of the other. We're coming to a point where if she doesn't make the mistake, Rob does. And for yeah. both of them, like they just overlap each other on mistakes. Rob has learned how to make really shitty decisions from her, and he is doing the same thing. And not only that, not only that, but now we got another Tully in the mix. And not only that, <sighs> we're at the seat. The home of the Tullys. Where it all started. Bad news. Bad news for the Northern Campaign. And they end a Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones ends on such a high point for the North and for the Starks. Despite all of the shitty things that happened because of Catelyn. Directly, indirectly, mostly directly. In spite of Catelyn Stark. How Stark is in a good spot. Especially all things considered at the end of A Game of Thrones. We're in agreement that most all the bad things that happened to House Stark during A Game of Thrones happened because of Catelyn. Well, she, she started it. And yes. she put uh, Ned in, bad, in a bad spot. Oh, a horrible spot. How, how could you do that to someone you love? I mean, looking back on it, she'd be like, God, yeah, you know, yeah, you're right, Jamie. I have no idea what... <laughs> this, this one's gone rogue. Bring her yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, I'll, free, I'll free Tyrion. I apologize. Bring her back. We'll put her to the north. We'll send her to the wall. All right? Ned Stark needed a, like a guy that would do, that would do dirty work. That <laughs> could almost be like his... Like a um, mountain. The mountain no, that rides. Like in, in the office... When, my, oh, when Michael had to fire someone and then Dwight <laughs> turned the job down. That he's would like, almost be like Ed Ard's, like, can you get it back? Are you talking about what, he's, when Michael's like, has to fire is, there someone any, and that- <laughs> is there anyone else that could fire him but me? And Dwight's like, I can, if you give me complete control. And no, he's like, no, 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 that's the, that's the, no, he did that before that with Stanley. He tried to fire Stanley. Right. And then yeah. he came back and. And, and Mike's like, I don't want you to fire Stanley. You get you the you twin fire Stanley. No, no, he brings in. He was going to bring in Creed. I mean, Creed oh, right. talks about. Oh, it. right, right, right. That was like says, season one, right, or season season two. Yeah, the Halloween and, one. Oh, uh, who was the guy? I forget his name now. Of course, Dwight rehired him at the end. Did he? Yeah, in the last episode when they catch up with them, they're doing yoga, and Dwight's catching the documentary up on how the office is going, and he's like, "Oh, I hired back whatever the guy's name oh, was." Exactly. I always liked his work. Right, just real quick, I'm God, I'm jumping off to the office right now, but real quick. Nah, it's all good. Um, Toby is definitely the scratch string of it. Oh, without a doubt, definitely. Yeah. What what did it for you? I knew it well, you know. You, you know, I believed in it definitely. It's definitely, it definitely is. But if you notice on the um, the time when the trailers, now the trailers again, chased by the police and they go past Dunham and Mifflin. Yeah. You know, obviously Toby's not there. Everyone in the office is there by Toby's seat, but Toby's not there. And if you notice the car. You see that car before, it's Toby's car that's in the parking lot. Oh, uh, no kidding. Yeah, the, the, that car's been in the parking lot before. The same green, it's, the same, it's, a, it's a green car. Oh, that's awesome. They're thinking about bringing the office back, like oh, an office revival? Let's talk about Catelyn Tully, that's going to be horrible. <laughs> no Michael Scott, come on. He's well, so no bad. Michael Scott, I think, I think no Dwight Schrute either, but if they Ugh. do bring it back, Toby should be in jail for murder. That should be the opening episode that they finally get the, the real Strangler. <laughs> Alright, anyway. 
What were we with Catlin? The oh, personality okay. problems, we always go off on two different... <laughs> two, uh, two different... Dude, we go off on The Office at least once every three episodes. We, we, we get like a good 20 minutes on The Office. Matter of fact, we could probably go back through our episodes, take out all The Office stuff. We probably have like a good Office podcast in there. Um... In Game of Thrones, all the tragedies that happen to House Stark, if we're going to blame it on, on Catelyn, that's fair. But now going into A Clash of you Kings. You think, okay, all right, they went, you know, House Stark, they went through a rough stretch there. Eddard's dead. It's a rough stretch. Okay, Arya is going back up north. All right, but, you know, she can meet up with her family. You're thinking, like, in Clash of Kings, you're thinking there's a reset button here. And George is... right. Maybe he had to do those things, and he's telling the story of of the new Lord of Winterfell. This is going to be his story. Rob, he's right? Gonna, he's going to win it for exactly, his father. Exactly. That's what I thought. I mean, I think that's what everyone thought. I mean, I, you know, I really says it turns around and says, "Oh, come on, yeah, I didn't think that." You're seeing that now because you know what happens. I think everyone had to have a good, like, like Rob's going down to King's Landing. He's going to do this. The surprise of Ned's death. You think that's as far as this guy is going right. to go? You think all right. He just had to get rid of that art. And it's, you know, it's about the kids. It was a surprise that Ned's dead, but obviously his son takes up the mantle of House Stark and he wins it and he gets revenge. We didn't know the depths of depravity of George R. R. Martin's relationship with the Starks. Furthermore, I think what that says is that we didn't see, it's hindsight that we see who Catelyn Stark is. Because if we thought, that this story would now be about Rob and his revenge and making things right for House Stark, then we weren't paying close enough to attention to what Catelyn Stark did in A Game of Thrones. Because if we were, if we, and I'm talking about on our first read, first watch, if we were paying attention to that, we'd realize that she's still in a incredibly powerful position to do great damage. But my question to you is, in A Clash of Kings, yes, she does make poor decisions, but it does feel like she's in more of a backseat than she is in A Game of Thrones. So the bad things that happened to House Stark, particularly Rob and his kingdom of Northmen and Rivermen, the bad things that happened to them over the course of A Clash of Kings and A Storm of Swords, yeah, it was all put into motion indirectly by Catelyn Stark, but would you say the bad things that happened in Clash of Kings, Storm of Swords are more because of Catelyn Stark decisions made during book two, book three, or Rob Stark decisions? I think, as I said before, I think it's a combination. This is definitely the end Rob does. The big thing, obviously, is taking Jenny Westerling as his wife and breaking his oath and promise Oof. with uh, Walter of Frey, which is definitely something that is pointed out by Catelyn in her, in her point of view. That she knew right away on that. Like, oh, it's not if she thinks good. it's a bad decision, it's like, uh-oh, that's a bad, yeah, that's like, a bad yeah, decision. I mean, if, she, if, if, if she realizing that this could go, <laughs> this can go haywire real, this can go south yeah. real quick, <laughs> you might want to take, you know, it's a, a closer look at some decisions. But at the same time, that we're jumping ahead here a little bit, and I'm sure you know we'll, we'll we'll get to it, you know, when we get to it. But it's like right around that time, you you have like the real. The two killers there. You have Jane Worthy and Rob Barry and Jane Wesley. And then you have the one that I always talk about. And that's Catelyn's next real big one is letting Jamie Lannister yes. free. Yes. I will say it on blue in the face. If Jamie Lannister is at the Red Wedding as a hostage, that Red Wedding does not go down. It definitely, definitely does not go down like that. You, that. you wouldn't see, you would never see Tywin okay a massacre and slaughter like that if he knew his yeah. son was there. Once he knew his son was not there, boom, go at it, go for it. <laughs> arrows, you, yeah, you got plenty of arrows. Who cares if some phrase get, you know, caught in the mm -hmm. crosswinds? And the phrase would never dream of shooting an arrow in Jamie Lannister's direction. No, but you never know if you had any, by accident, uh, a stray arrow or, you know. Just you're saying they, would, they wouldn't even chance it, is what you're saying. Well, Tywin would never chance it. Tywin would never, like, no, my son's there. You're not going to do that. You know, we'll think of something else. You can poison him maybe or something, but you're not going to have, you know, archers from the top because i'm sure they the phrase they went over their plan with this is what we're going to do we have it set up where we're going to have the musicians are going to be uh, crossbowers as far as i can tell how that went down but it was planned out by Roose bolton and black walder and lame luther Frey were the main planners of the red wedding and as far as tywin's involvement he gave the okay he gave the okay for it yeah all right do it 
I don't want to know what you do. Just make it happen. My son's not there. Yeah. Do it. Just do it. I don't care. Less I know, the better off I am, just as long as Jamie's yeah. not there. But it's those two, they almost come within like, I don't know, I mean, how close, they were very close decision-making processes that spelt the doom of how stark. Yeah. While we're talking about it, if Jamie Lannister was there at that Red Wedding, how do you think, I mean, it's not the Red Wedding, but how do you think that plays out if he's there? I'm just thinking about this right now. I said two seconds ago, like, maybe they try to poison him. However, they try to poison him. You would think the North would be like, what's going on? They might start calling a ruckus. And at that point, anyways, you still might get a bloodbath. There would probably be no choice but a bloodbath. And anyway, I'm just, I'm just thinking about that right now. What yeah. would Lord Umber is just going to be like, oh, not just my king. He's choking on some wine. It's okay. Right. Don't worry about it. I'm sure he's going to get up and cross a ruckus. I mean, basically, you can't, you know, you take out Rob, you really need to take out everybody. You have to take out the North in one swoop. You know, one swooping crane shot. You got to take them all out. <laughs> it's a swooping crane shot from above. Because if you don't, if you don't do that, what's the point? You poisoned a king, a king who had guessed right, which is kind of what they they do anyway. It had to be all or nothing for the phrase to pull that off. I get what you're saying. If Jamie was there, it wouldn't have happened. So you can blame that on Catelyn, but a lot of decisions. I, I think it's more like what you said, a combination, because a lot of decisions that Rob made. Led them to that point, but one without the other, Catelyn without Rob, Rob without Catelyn, in these two middle books, Clash of Kings, Storm of Swords, it's just the worst duo, like the worst leadership ever, maybe in the history of fiction, the worst leadership ever. Horrible. Before we get into Catelyn in A Clash of Kings, a couple things I wanted to touch on from A Game of Thrones, and first off is... A very important, very major scene, which we have talked about in the past, and I think we even talked about in our intro episodes to Catelyn Stark, but we didn't go over it in the Game of Thrones narrative because it wasn't a Catelyn POV chapter. It was a John POV chapter, and it's the chapter where he goes to visit Bran before he leaves for the Night's Watch, and he has that run-in with Catelyn. We did talk about it, but I think it warrants mentioning in regards to Catelyn's narrative. For me... The way Catelyn is portrayed in that chapter, it doesn't really click with the Catelyn POVs that we get. Knowing Catelyn, we're not surprised by her behavior there, but when I initially read A Game of Thrones, the conversation she had with Jon, the things that she said to him in Bran's room, it seemed really out of character for her, and I was surprised that she was saying these things. What were your initial feelings when you read that chapter? Try to go back to my, you know, I'm just trying to envision myself reading that because you know it's the first time really reading it. So, so really- John Snow wasn't as, especially at that point, he wasn't who he is to you now, right? I was starting to think that I was really not liking this this Catelyn. This Catelyn was kind of bugging yeah. me a little bit. Well, and that chapter would be the chapter. Yeah, she just sounded like an evil woman. Like how could you just like you know you should have been the one who got pushed out. John's like, but I don't climb walls. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not your stupid <laughs> son that doesn't obey orders. That's probably going to be the death of us all. <laughs> what are you talking about? Why, why should I have fallen off the roof? Yeah, she's so spiteful there. And it's, it's one thing that she doesn't like John. Whatever she thinks of John's mother, the rift that John caused between her and Ned, that's one thing. But for her to say those things next to Bran, who may never wake up from a coma, knowing that Bran has great fondness for his half-brother, that's pretty fucked up. Right. That's a, that's a very good point. You know, like, look at that, your, your son here, as you just said, as a father for John, out of respect yeah. for him, let this be their moment. You know, instead, she's got to make it all about her. House Tully, I want you to leave. It should have been you. What do you mean? I don't climb walls. Hypothetically speaking, if John would have killed Catelyn right there with Eddard scene, what do you think Eddard would have done? He would have been like, ooh. All right. I can't do anything to him. This is, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say I blame you. I, 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 You're going to the Night's Watch anyway, so we'll just, we'll just let this go. I hate to jump ahead again, but it's not something that I think we're going to get, or maybe we will. We're not going to get in the Game of Thrones if we get a Winds of Winter, a Dream of Spring, God forbid. Do you think we'll get a Jon Snow, Lady Stoneheart meeting? It seems kind of poetic that you would, right? You would. I, I definitely, I definitely think you're definitely gonna get at least 
if and when John comes back down south to the wall and goes back to Winterfell, and wherever he does in Winterfell, he comes back, and, and if he isn't definitely, in fact, in the book, which I believe will be put in the book, will be named King of the North, I'm sure Lady Stoneheart will find out. I mean, surely, you know, the Brotherhood of Battles, like, oh, you know, your husband's bastard's back, you know. There are some theories that Lady Stoneheart will find out that John's mom's Lyanna, and John will die again somehow. Jesus. <laughs> and Lady Stoneheart will be the one to give John his, you know, the last cast, the last, his, the last breath of life to him. Yeah, I don't know if I'd buy that because, uh, I don't know. Because then what, what, what would John be then coming back a second time brought to life by Lady Stoneheart? Right. Because I still think he's different than being Barrack and all. I still think he's different than Barrack. Yeah. And Barrack's different than Barrack going from TV show to, to book, like vastly different. Right. Well, there was a big, before season seven was coming out, there was big suggestions and theories that John was going to die at the Battle right. of the Wall, and Beric was going to give... So a lot of people say, well, yeah, Beric's going to do it on the show, and since Beric is dead in the books, and actually Lady gets Stoneheart, that Lady Stoneheart would give him right. the books. But John didn't die again. And I don't think he's going to. And if he does, it'll be a final... Uh, let's not get into it, but I don't think that he does, because he already, he already did. Mm-hmm. So what would be the point? A couple things just to mention about... Catelyn's Game of Thrones narrative besides besides that John chapter. Highlighting her reunion with Littlefinger and how easily she trusts him after everything that happened when they last saw each other, that doesn't sit well with me. And it makes me think that Catelyn is being very, very naive. Not thinking the way a noble woman should think, but not thinking things through the way the lady of a warden, warden of the North, should think. Because she should have thought how they parted ways and how things were the last fortnight that Peter Baelish lived at River Run. She should have realized that there might be bad blood there and he might be manipulating things. I think this is stuff that we might might have missed in the last podcast about the Game of Thrones stuff. It's just what you're saying right now with Littlefinger. It's like, how can she... Oh my God, this can't... It's just going to drum me nuts. It's it's going to like... Just when she talks to Ed, oh, he's always been her friend. He's always been her friend. And Ned's like, what do you mean? He tried to kill my brother. My brother was almost killed him. Was it for you? You know, normal human reaction would be he doesn't think too kindly of how Stark, you know. <laughs> right. And we're going to believe this guy now? Like, ugh. And then Ned's like, all right, well, fine, I will. <laughs> yeah. George has to write this story somehow. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing that just really fucking gets me, bro. It really, the more I think about it, it doesn't make any sense to me is the fact that nearly all of the information that's led Ned to King's Landing, that's made them suspect Lannister's and John Aaron's death, that put all of this shit into motion, that made Catelyn take Tyrion hostage, all this information came from a fucking secret language invented by two young girls. And Ned's just like, oh... Oh, it was a secret language you guys invented like when you were little and now you're 35 and I guess you still remember the secret language and she's telling you that the Lannisters killed John Aaron. Oh my God. All right. I'll be, be hand to the king in King's Landing. Yeah. Now we're going to King's Landing and we're believing this guy who, who tried to challenge and kill my brother, obviously to no avail. We're just going to keep on yeah. believing this guy. On the same line of like that, that irkiness that gets me is, is the scene where in the show, and I'm not sure how it goes in the books. I actually forgot now how it goes in the books. It's a third Clash of Kings. But in the show, they have Little Fear coming to meet up with the Starks and Little Fear is dropping off in the show, trying to make a move in the right. tent. He's trying to move on in the tent and she's like, have you no dignity? My puzzle just died. You're, you're doing this little thing. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, he turns around, well, Oh, I'm sure you want to know what happens to your daughters. And then, and then like, right away, it's like, what was that? Like, he knows exactly how to pull yes. her strings. And that's a show-only scene. It was Ned's bones that he was bringing as a, sign, a show of good faith. Yes. Ugh, Catelyn. That was the guy that betrayed Ugh. your husband. And he tried to kill your husband's brother. <laughs> and he's going to try and marry your daughter, your underage daughter. Like, oh, he's like a brother to me. You can get past mistakes, man, because everyone everybody in this probably in this book has made mistakes. You can go down the line, but when you start, like you know, this whole time, Peter will never hurt us; he'll never harm us. Last question before we get into Clash of Kings: Peter does manipulate her. Peter does through Catelyn, through Lysa, put a lot of these events into play with their ultimate destination 
Catelyn's, not Lysa's, Catelyn's ultimate destination being the Red Wedding. Do you think that's what Littlefinger foresaw when he started manipulating, pulling these strings? We know his plan in Game of Thrones. I think it'll be a little bit different in A Song of Ice and Fire, but probably along the same lines, using Sansa as to get uh, the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. As a poem. Yeah, right. Going about it a different way. So was that, when he set out to do this, was that his plan? Or do you think he foresaw somehow getting Catelyn to be Queen of the Seven Kingdoms? I mean, that's just not possible. I'm just thinking his envisioning, if you know, you're looking down the line, I don't think you're envisioning Callan Tully is being a major piece. Right. He knows he can manipulate her. And he's in love with her, but she'll never love him the same. So go for the daughter instead, because she looks like Catelyn, and she's young. Catelyn makes note that she was younger than Sansa when she was betrothed, which is when this went down with Peter Baelish and Brendan Stark. So Sansa being right at that age is kind of Littlefinger doing that over and getting to be the winner with the destruction of House Stark. Maybe he didn't want the destruction of House Tully altogether, but they would have stood in his way if they remained. Even though Hoster died, when he set these plans into motion, Hoster was still alive. They kept the secrets of Hoster's health. They didn't advertise how bad Hoster Tully's health was. I'm sure Littlefinger had his spies. He knew. But if Littlefinger made a play, it brought about the downfall of House Stark. The Tullys probably would have stood in his way, stood against him. He must have planned for the fall of House Tully also. You know what? Maybe he did plan for an untimely end for Catelyn one way or another. I mean, he killed her sister, right? And she's a fucking idiot, but it's still his sister. He always loved Sansa anyways, from afar. I love that chapter. All right, getting into Clash of Kings. When we left Catelyn and Rob in Game of Thrones, Rob had just been declared king in the north. Technically also king of the Riverlands, though not sanctioned in any way whatsoever by the Iron Throne. We get Catelyn as less of a mover and shaker than she was in A Game of Thrones. She kind of like lays in the weeds the first part of Clash of Kings, really. She doesn't, you know, she's just kind of like floating in the river just a little bit. She's not, you know. like a snake in the grass. But then when she she sees sees that dive coming, though, she goes right for it. She's like Randy Orton waiting for the perfect time to strike. With that RKO. Yeah. But Catelyn won. She is observing Rob holding court. And this is where we begin the back and forth of Sir Cleos Frey, who was taken prisoner during the battle at River Run. Battle of Camps, I believe they called it. Sir Cleos Frey was taken captive there. And he's a Frey by name, but he is a Lannister at heart because he is the son of Jenna Lannister and her marriage to, um, shit, which Frey is it? It doesn't fucking matter. There's too many Freys, but... Basically, she's Jenna Frey, but the Frey became a Lannister more so than she became a Frey. So Sir Cleos Frey is a Lannister because of who his mother is. And he gets captured and he is used as a as a back and forth, as a median between the Lannisters and the Starks. Because the War of the Five Kings, at least on the side of the Starks and the Lannisters, they're kind of taking a breather, getting the lay of the land. So Cleos is going to carry a message to Cersei. And then come back, return to his captivity. They're suing for peace. It's an offer of peace that's, that Rob is making to the Lannisters. And it's a ridiculous offer that the Lannisters can't possibly agree to. What's even funny is, I, probably even Rob probably thinks, listen, there's no way he's going to take this. Right. But Catelyn wants more. Catelyn wants better terms. Like, probably not going to accept this, but I need better terms. I'm worried about my yeah, girls. We need the girls back. It's like, dude, you're not, you're definitely not getting the girls back. It's not going to, you're never going to see them again. Like, if you can just accept that, I feel like life would be better for everybody in the Riverlands and in the North. And it's poetic that ultimately she doesn't. Rob is wearing his new crown, which was based on the original crown of the King of the North, the one that was lost to Aegon the Conqueror. But they don't have like an exact drawing of it. It's what people say it looks like as passed down through word of mouth over the years. Lord Rickard Karstark leaves the Hall of River Run in disgust when he learns that Rob is sending Sir Cleos to King's Landing with a message, an offer of peace. The reason Rickard Karstark is so pissed off is because his two sons were killed by Jamie Lannister and he wants he wants this war to end with the Lannister is dead, all of them. Well, listen, I understand, and I've always understood, like, he's upset. Right. Like, he's upset his son's died, but what do you expect in war? Like, do you expect your son not to die? Yeah. Did you expect, like, what about, like, 
someone else. I'm sure their sons died in war too. And he just like, I don't know. I mean, it's always like, what do, what do you expect in war? Do you expect that your sons are going to go like undefeated? Basically, everybody that died in war is a son. So lots of sons died. You know, everybody's got parents, so they're all sons. And, you know, it's mostly men that are fighting these battles. I mean, it sucks. I feel bad. It's no reason to just continue this war until everybody's dead. The terms that Rob offers are Sansa and Arya must be released. After they're released, Rob will release Willem and Tion Lannister. Sansa's betrothal to Joffrey is to end. Eddard's bones and the bones of his household must be returned, along with ice the Valyrian steel greatsword of House Stark. Lord Tywin must release all his captives from the Green Fork, which would be mostly rivermen. When they're released, Rob will release his captives except for Jamie. Jamie will remain a hostage because Rob knows, along with every other person in that in, camp except, except for, one. for one, that without Jamie, they got nothing. So he's going to remain a hostage. Joffrey will renounce all claim to the North and the Riverlands. And Maester Vyman drew a map denoting the new borders for Rob's new kingdom. The agreement will be secured by 10 highborn hostages, two of which Rob will release each year that there is peace. So these are ridiculous terms, and there's no way that anybody's going to agree to it. Rob knows they're ridiculous terms. Everybody knows, everybody knows that they're ridiculous terms. If Lord Rickard didn't storm out, out of the hall, he would see that they're ridiculous terms and that there is no intention on Rob's side to actually have peace. But after Cleos Frey is sent on his way, Catelyn, Edmure, and Rob have a little mind-melding, a meeting of the minds. Catelyn is worried about Lord Rickard, which is funny because she's worried about him here, but gives no thought to him later on. Catelyn wanted better terms. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> your anger and your lust for power have already done that. <laughs> That's what I keep on thinking about right now. I'm thinking, when I think of her right now. Unbelievable. Which just like, wants more and more. It's like, hold on, give me that map. I want King's Landing yeah. as part of our as part of the North. At least half of King's Landing. You're gonna call it Catelyn's Landing. Edmure thinks they should march on Harrenhal, but Rob's like, dude, we don't have the strength, and our host gets smaller day by day because you gave leave to your river lords to return to their lands. So how are we gonna march on Harrenhal? And that's true. Sir Mark Piper, Lord Carol Vance, or Jonas Bracken, they've already left. Jason Malister intends to do the same. They want to go back to their lands because their lands have been ravaged by the mountain. And they want to be able to protect their lands, check on their castles, check on their families. Catelyn continues to badger Rob about the girls, angering him. And Rob says, can you please like get the fuck out of here? Can you go to Winterfell or to the Twins and find me a wife? He asks her nicely, though. She says she must stay with her father while he lives. So then Rob, and here is a key point in the war, Rob is going to send Theon to Pike to treat with his father, Lord Balin Greyjoy, to get longships, which will help out in the war. Catelyn does not approve of this. So, I, as much as I hate her, this is a time where she's actually right. Bad decision by Rob. Horrible decision. But Rob is a, he's a kid, and Theon has been his friend for most of his life, so... You can understand Rob's thinking. He's trusting his friend. But Catelyn doesn't see Theon as a friend. She sees Theon as a hostage. And she's saying to Rob, you're letting go of your hostage, the one thing that keeps Lord Balin Greyjoy in check. Don't do it. She goes to see her father. Sir Brendan is with him. Catelyn tells the Blackfish that Hoster sleeps most of the time now. He gets weaker every day. He doesn't make any sense when he speaks. Catelyn is happy that Brendan has made peace with him. Going back to our initial episode, Brendan and Hoster had the falling out over the marriage pact with whoever the fuck it was, the, uh, the red wine, um, Bethany Redwine. Catelyn makes note of the comment. And this side note is one of my favorite parts about A Clash of Kings is the comment that shows up. I, I guess it's like the first third of A Clash of Kings. There's that comment going through the sky. Mm -hmm. And everybody looks at it as a herald for greatness on their side. Some take it as a bad omen. Great John Umber thinks Comet is a message of vengeance sent by the old gods. <laughs> it's okay, dude. Ed Muir, he thinks it's Tully Red and it heralds victory for House Tully. But Catelyn fears... Really? What? Yeah. Oh, so that, that just goes to show you how... Uh... 
He said that right after they saved his ass and got him out of, out of, oh, the, out of the cage. <laughs> this whole entire house is just really just aggravating. It's just so conceited and, jeez. It's like they have no experience in the real world. Catelyn fears it is Lannister Crimson and spells defeat. Brendan just says it heralds blood. And he says that fighting is going badly in the Riverlands. Sir Mark, Lord Carl have won minor victories. Lord Beric continues to raid the Lannister rear. But Sir Burton Crakehold claimed to have killed Lord Beric, but he's still alive. So this is where we first start to hear about the conflicting reports of Lord Beric's death. Shit's going bad for the River Lords. Otherwise, they're losing battles to Lannister forces. And then the big news, the worst news of all, was that Sir Stafford Lannister and Sir Davin Lannister are gathering another army. They're raising another host at Casterly Rock. And even though this army won't be as strong, it'll be sellswords, free riders, and it will take time to put into the field it will still be another large host for Rob to deal with. The Blackfish thinks Lord Tywin wants Rob to march on Harrenhal, and it would be foolish. This was Edmure's idea. It's one of the mightiest castles in Westeros, so how are they going to take it? Catelyn decides they must force Tywin to come out, and the only way to do that is to convince Renly to come north. All right, good thinking by Catelyn, but I doubt that Brynden and Rob have not thought of that already. She's probably a little bit late to the party. So how many Catelyn chapters did we have in A Game of Thrones? I don't feel like we have as many in The Clash of Kings. There's seven altogether in The Clash of Kings. I feel like there's like nine or ten, I think. Yeah. It seemed like, like nine or eleven, maybe. At least it seemed that way. We have a large break in action for Catelyn. Well, it's time for her to make mistakes. Catelyn 1 is chapter 8 overall in The Clash of Kings. Catelyn 2... They go down to chapter 20, 15 more chapters till you get to chapter 2. Chapter 23 overall. And we meet up with her in Catelyn 2 where she's already riding south to meet with Renly. And she has with her 20 Winterfell guards, five lordlings, Sir Wendell Manderley, Lucas Blackwood, Sir Perrin Frey, to name a few. And this is her escort going to meet with Renly. She did not want to go, but Rob convinced her that there was no one else. But let me ask you a question. Sure. You know, we end Game of Thrones with... I'm not sure when it was in the English but in the book. Well, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not, I'm not just confusing the show stuff only here. But Rob was saying that can't declare for Renly because Bran can't come lord before I am, then Renly can't come before yes. Stannis. So let me ask you a question. Why is Rob sending Catelyn to meet with Renly and not Stannis? That's a good point. Especially because of the stink that he did make at the end of the Game of Thrones, that Renly calls himself king. Even if that was true, he can't come before Stannis. So Stannis would be king before Renly. Right. But meanwhile, right. yeah, now he's sending his mom to treat with Renly. And I think that, I think it's more of when he said that they came off a big victory and they had one back river run. And now he's looking at the playing field and he knows that he needs some help from somewhere. And I guess looking at Stannis and looking at Renly, although he's never met either one of them, I'm sure the Blackfish has. I'm sure some people in his um, upper echelon of lords have some experience with either Stannis or Renly, and it's probably unanimous that Renly is much easier to deal with, much more likely to join forces as Stannis is set in his ways. And if Stannis didn't come seeking out an alliance, chances are he's not going to be open to an alliance. I would think that's part of it. But I think what the masterful stroke for Rob Stark is in this situation is he gets rid of Catelyn. And yeah, we talk about how Rob and Catelyn, it's, it's a dynamic duo, hand in hand, they're making horrible decisions. But it is true also that at the beginning of A Clash of Kings, Rob did not want Catelyn around. I think he wanted her to just go back to Winterfell, like she was fucking ordered to by Ned when he left Winterfell. Right, like, like how she should have been doing. It's so crazy, right? Like, like Ned leaves Winterfell and he's like, all right, I'm, I'm going to leave Winterfell. I'm going to leave you in charge. Teach Rob to be a ruler. And she, it's like, as soon as he left Winterfell, like, she left Winterfell. <laughs> yeah, like, she's like, all right, all right, Ned. I'm trying to think. Of what's that? I promise I'll do that for you, Ned. <laughs> I'm just thinking of Catelyn, like, how she, how she, just, how she, check, how she checked out months Oh, my ago. God, dude. She has, like, she's, Winterfell is the farthest <laughs> thing from her mind and has been since Ned left. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to do this, but Catelyn checked out. It's crazy. Like, that was the whole plan. You stay at Winterfell. 
you convinced me to go to King's Landing because of your sister and your fucking fake language. Fine. You stay here at Winterfell and teach Rob. Okay, no problem. Like two days later, she's, little figure's like, oh, your, your wife's here. He's like, what? <laughs> what she the fuck are you herself. doing here? <laughs> like, oh, uh, someone tried to kill Bran. Okay, so what are you doing here? Why are you here? If someone's trying to kill Bran at Winterfell. Why are you here? And then that was it. She never gets back. Going back to Rob, I think he, he probably feels like she was cramping his style. And you know what? She's not a, a bad envoy. You know, who else is he going to send? Bruce Bolton's not around. I mean, obviously, he's also untrustworthy, but they don't know the extent of that yet. But who else Who else are they going to send? You know? So they send Catelyn with some northern lords, a couple river lords. She's going to go treat with Renly. I don't think Rob is counting on it. Doesn't seem like any of the plans that he made counted on Renly coming through for them. It would be a tremendous boon if he had, but... Well, we, we, we've stated it so countless times that this war could have been easily won with an allied North mm-hmm. and Storm's End, an allied Stark mm-hmm. and Baratheon. But because of Stannis and Renly not getting, a, you know, really, I, I have to blame Renly. I really do. I, I have to blame Renly. You know, I, I'm a man of rifle succession, although they didn't have a right in my eyes. Well, that's, you know, you, you know how I think. But going based on out of the brothers, out of them, the rifle yeah. thing will go to Stannis. Me, my thing is I'm on Stannis' side right on yeah. that. Uh, of the two of them, he's the rightful heir to anything. Doesn't matter if he's a jerk. <laughs> and he know. can't possibly, if you look at that, you know, let's let's save it for when we get to it. it it's coming up in, I believe, the next Catelyn chapter. You know, looking at that situation yeah. between Stannis and Renly, which is an awesome chapter, by the way. As Catelyn was leaving to ride south, Rob was preparing to march. And Catelyn notes that the Riverlands, they're dangerous, there's fighting all over, but the war has not passed south of the Blackwater. As they ride, they encounter a scouting party led by Sir Colin of Greenpools, and he tells Catelyn that Renly is camped near Bitterbridge. And this is where the Rose Road crosses the Mander, and the Mander is the second biggest river in Westeros next to the Trident, and functions kind of a natural, um, a natural barrier to the Reach. But Sir Colin of Greenpools escorts Catelyn and her party to Bitterbridge. As they get close to the Mander, Renly's huge host becomes visible thousands of campfires, and they find that a great melee is being held next to the castle of Bitterbridge in front of a large crowd. As they ride up, a knight bearing the colors of House Tarth on horses, Red Ron Connington, who is cousin to our boy Sir John Connington, Lord John Connington. Sir Colin tells Catelyn to have her men wait there, and he will present her. As she approaches the dais, she notes some of his lords and ladies, including Lord Mathis Rowan, Lord Randall Tarley, Lady Arwen O'Cart, at the center of them sits Renly and his new wife, Queen Marjorie Tyrell. The melee is almost over now, with only four knights remaining. The Tarth Knight quickly and horses two of them, leaving the crowd favorite, Sir Loris, as the final opponent. Loris almost wins, but the Tarth Knight manages to turn the tide and defeat him. Catelyn asks Sir Colin who the knight is, and she's shocked to learn that the knight is a woman. Brienne of Tarth. Renly declares her the champion of the field of 116 knights and says he will give her any reward she asks. Brienne of Tarth asks to join his Rainbow Guard, and he agrees. She's anointed Brienne the Blue. Sir Colin brings Catelyn forward. (laughs) Renly says he will see justice done for Eddard Stark. Lord Caswell has given Renly use of his castle, so he gives her use of his royal pavilion and offers her a place at the feast to be held that night. Real quick with Brienne of Tarth. You're not the biggest fan? No, God, I'm just, ugh, no, I'm not. Now, is that, no. let me ask you, is that a Brienne of Tarth thing, or is that a, whatever the fuck the actress's name is, thing? Gwendolyn Christie, who was useless in Star Wars The Last Jedi, and actually in The Force Awakens, no. Um, it, that really has something to, well, maybe the show version of her, I, I do find her a bit, yeah. a bit annoying. Kind of like how I find Shay annoying a little bit, you know, like this. There's, there's something about that that annoys me. The main thing about with Brienne is, I know I'll probably get killed for this, but whatever. I just can't stand her chapters and Feast of Crows. Okay. I think like Storm of Swords, Brienne. No, she's she's not a POV. I mean, she's in it, but she's not a POV until uh, Feast for Crows. No, okay, she's not a POV, right? Until Feast but yeah, her Crows. chapters are very meandering and it's slow moving. They ultimately go oh, nowhere. God, 
Very slow moving. Exactly. That's what I can't like. That's what I don't like about it. That's what I do not like about it. And maybe that's kind of just part of George, because George kind of just kept on writing and writing and writing and writing all his characters in circles. I mean, we can probably make some of the same excuses for some of Danny's stuff in book five and some of John's stuff in book five that it just really just drags out a little bit. It's just not really going anywhere. Tyrion stuff also. Well, I'm just going to have them all just go around in circles. Some writers are gardeners. Some are architects. I'm a gardener. I can't help what grows in my garden. Yeah, the thing with Brienne's chapters in A Feast for Crows, you're right, they are meandering, they are somewhat frustrating, especially considering the high that Storm of Swords leaves you on. If you pay attention to some of the stuff that she goes through, you, you are able to get some little confirmations on how the war has ravaged the yes. the uh, the Riverlands area. So, that's good. But, like, I'm just I like, see her name right now. It's just like amazing. And she came from being want to be a member of the Rainbow and get being a member of the Rainbow Guard, mm-hmm. which I mean, <laughs> Rainbow Guard. <laughs> I mean, if really didn't want any rumors of him being gay, that's not really you know yeah. trying to calm those uh, flames. Oh, but it just I, I'm just like almost like an amazement. It's like she started out so little, and here she is. You know, two books later, she's a major POV. Yeah, you're right about. George's problems, it's really a meta statement because her meandering in the Riverlands, it's like George meandering with this whole fucking story and not getting anywhere, just like she doesn't get anywhere. That being said, if you can look at her chapters outside the overall saga, which is hard to do because that's why we're reading the books in the first place, but her chapters are really enjoyable if you're not looking for a follow-up to Storm of Swords. I'm going to have to slightly disagree. I'm going to have to slightly disagree. I see what you're saying, but you can eliminate Branch Tathers from Feast of Crows. And I just, I, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, I, you're, totally I, I think you're still in the, you know, you, you're still, we're still talking about the still ma- major, you know, points of, you know, of the Feast of Crows stuff, like, you know, the Great Joys. You have, you know, the Martell stuff, you know, the um, Cersei stuff. She doesn't even have to be in that book at all. You get two major things with her chapters in A Feast for Crows. I mean, it depends on your definition of major, but. Unknowingly, you get confirmation that Sandor Clegane is alive. And, well, not even confirmation, but it, it looks like Sandor Clegane is alive. And you get to finally see Lady Stoneheart. So I'm going to say you can't remove all of her chapters, but you can probably cut down to like three Brienne chapters. Meanwhile, she I'll, had I'll, the. I'll, I'll, give you the lady, I'll give you the Lady Stoneheart. I'll, I'll give you that. You're right about that. But the stuff before that, though, you can just, like, you know, eliminate 50 pages from Feast of Crows, you freaking set. Well, don't forget the chapter where you see who we think is Sandra Clegane. You also get that that big monologue, which is, like, one of the more famous monologues in A Song of Ice and Fire. The monologue by, what the fuck is it, Septon, uh, whatever the fuck his name is. The guy that fucking asshole was supposed to be taking the place of in season six. Maribald? Yeah, Septon Maribald. Yeah, yeah. You get his monologue. Not that even that's worth the price of admission with her chapters. I agree with you. If you're saying 100% are unnecessary, I'm going to say like 85% of it is unnecessary. But I will say, if you go back, here's how I'm saying it. If you go back, right, and you go through Feast for Crows and you just read Brienne chapter to Brienne chapter, it's an enjoyable read if you can put it outside A Song of Ice and Fire. It's just a cool little story, but it doesn't fit and it meanders and it's neither the time or place. It'd be like putting a bunch of Dunkin' Egg chapters in A Dance with Dragons, and it's like, what does this have to do with anything? And ultimately, it has nothing to do with anything. Anyway. What the fuck were we? Uh, so, at the feast, Catelyn is seated between Lord Mathis and Sir John Fossaway. She makes note of all the other southern lords, lords of the Reach, that are at the feast. Renly sits with Marjorie on his left, and Sir Loras on his right. Catelyn realizes they are all so young and unblooded and she labels them the Knights of Summer. Renly asks her to take a walk with him. The first thing he asks her is if Sir Barristan the Bold has been sighted at River Run, and he is disappointed that he has disappeared. He had been saving the final spot on the Rainbow Guard for Sir Barristan the Bold. <laughs> Do you think Sir Barristan is going to join a fucking... No. <laughs> no way. So instead of Sir Barristan the Blue, he gets Lady Brienne the Blue, or whatever he calls her. He takes her to the battlements of the castle to gaze out at his army. He says he has 80,000 with 10,000 more at High Garden, commanded by Lord Mace Tyrell. 
and he has a strong garrison at Storm's End. He will triumph. Then he tells her if Rob bends the knee and joins him, he can keep his titles. He can even call himself King of the North and rule as he pleases, but he must swear fealty to King Renly. Catelyn, instead of saying, well, that sounds good, she says, doesn't Stannis have a right to the throne? Renly counters that he would make, Stannis that is, would make an appalling king. He plans to win the throne as Robert won his throne through force of arms. As they're talking, a rider appears and calls for the king, and he says that Storm's End is under siege. Renly's like, by who, the Lannisters? And then he's like, nah, Stannis. And that's where we end that chapter. So the key thing, Renly will team up with Rob. Rob can call himself king in the north. Rob can do whatever he wants. He just has to recognize Renly as his overlord. If you're Rob Stark, deal or no deal? I still don't think anyone realizes or fully realizes <laughs> that if they were all just united, they would have won this war. And it's just bugging me. Yeah. It's bugging me big time. I mean, I, mean, I guess you take you would take that deal, but... Like, what do you think Stannis is going to do? Like, don't you think, like, Rob has to think, well, what about Stannis? Well, Rob's definitely thinking that, but there's no way that Stannis' army, obviously Stannis' army doesn't match up with Renly's. The wild card here being Melisandre. Nobody's going to expect what happens. That being said, Renly has the greater power. Renly has more wealth. Renly has armies that haven't fought yet. So Renly looks like the stronger of the Baratheon brothers. And Ned made the mistake of not agreeing to put Renly on the throne, to not listening to Renly's advice at King's Landing, to taking right. the royal children. So Renly bounced on him. And Rob, I mean, Rob doesn't even get to make the decision here. It's Catelyn that has the decision. She doesn't make a decision. And then, then options cut out from underneath them. But if Rob had been given that option, the smart money would be for him to say yes, but I feel like he is his father's son and he may go the route of... Stannis is the rightful king. It'd be dishonorable to declare for Renly. I feel like that's what Rob would do. Trying to be like Ned. You know, and his northern lords would be like, yeah. Meanwhile, he would lose the war. I think maybe also, but, but maybe in high, also if I just take the, we take the Renly, he might also look at the numbers, but he also might look at the fact that Renly is a little bit closer at his age than Stannis. So maybe yes. you might look at Renly like, oh, we're, we, we, we're close in age, wherever the age difference is. I'm sure it's maybe 10 years or whatever it is, probably right now. About Yeah. Maybe, just give, give or take. I'm sure Stannis is older. You know, Stannis is, you know, more to the you know upper 30s, where probably, you know, Renly's probably younger 30s, and Rob is 15, 16. Stannis is in the Robert Baratheon, Eddard Stark generation. Right. He's only a couple of years younger like than Kind of like Renly... Although it was born during the time of Robert's Rebellion, he was a babe still, kind of. He was only, like, what, four or five, I believe. Yeah, I think maybe even three. Yeah, so um, he's kind of, like, of age, on the same age timeline, almost, as Rob. So maybe Rob would look at him more, you know, as a... Um, identify with right, his... Yeah, more identify with him. Yeah. So maybe that might change his mind on the whole, like, well, Stas had, you know, Renly, but he identify more with Renly. Maybe that's better for the realm if you have two people at the same age, you know, f- you know, fighting on the same side. To hell with status. Yeah, yeah I guess Re- Renly's probably, I mean, he's definitely older than Rob, but he's probably younger than Jamie. So probably Tyrion would be real close in age to Renly. But yeah, I, I would think Renly and Rob would think more along the same lines. But their reasons for being in this war are completely different. For Renly, it's almost like vanity. He wants to be king. He thinks he'll be a good king. All right, it doesn't matter what you think, because you're, <laughs> depending on Joffrey being a Baratheon or not, you're like either sixth in line to be king or like second in line to be king. Not counting Targaryens or secret Targaryens. Catelyn three, Lady Catelyn, flanked by Sir Wendell and Hallis Mullen, arrive at an empty field. And this is the meeting place chosen for a parlay. One of the greatest Love parlays it. in history. Best parlay ever. <laughs> The parlay between Stannis and Renly. And this is kind of the first time we meet Stannis. We meet him in the prologue, but we don't really get too much right. of him in the prologue. And, it's more and, and of a, with the prologue, though, too, you, you really don't know if you're really already going to meet him. Is this just kind of a tease? You know, are, are we teasing yeah. this character? You know, we heard a yeah. lot of about him in the first book, and now all of a sudden, now we're finally actually seeing him. So along those lines, does he meet your expectations? 
when you finally meet him? You know, I have to say, like, even when you watch the show in the first the first season, you read the book, it's almost kind of pointed out as that Stannis is evil. You think so? I think so. I I mean, I always yeah. I I took him as he would be a villain. That Stannis was a villain. I mean, am I am I wrong on that? Well, no, you're you're right in the sense that everybody that talks about him has nothing good to say about him. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. But at the same time, like nobody's got anything good to say about it. But like, oh yes, like Stannis wanted to eliminate whores. <laughs> but at the same time, Ned doesn't speak badly about him. I don't think he speaks highly of him, but Ned gives him the seal of approval. He endorses Stannis. So I think Ned doing that, right. plus him being yeah. Robert's brother, whether it painted him as a good guy or a bad guy, it painted him as a character different than the one that we got, at least for me. And... I was kind of disappointed after hearing all this stuff about Stannis and Game of Thrones to finally meeting him, especially in this parlay when you wanted them to come together to beat the Lannisters. It's really not until A Dance with Dragons that Stannis becomes one of my favorite characters because of his campaign in the North. At the end of Storm of Swords, he's not existent in Feast for Crows and then the stuff he does in A Dance with Dragons. More so, the Theon chapter from The Winds of Winter. For all we know, that may be all we ever get for Winds of Winter. That might be that might be <laughs> that might best, be the, Winds of might be the best for Winds of Winter we've ever got. Yeah. So the chosen meeting place for Parlay between Stannis and Renly, storms and looms in the distance, and let's not forget the storms end factor within the relationship of Stannis and Renly between all the Baratheons. But particularly it's Stannis, because he has Stannis. That should be his. Catelyn reflects on Storm's End, so we learn some backstory on the castle. Catelyn points out that Stannis is not the rightful king either and learns about Cersei's incest. Yeah. Like, that doesn't make any sense, though. Well, no, because this is where she first hears about the incest. Or maybe she's heard rumblings of it, but this is the first time she hears about Joffrey being Jaime and Cersei's son and not Robert. Okay, son. okay, so she's still in the inclination that it's... Unfortunately, it's still Joffrey's... Still Joffrey's throne, yeah. Okay, never mind, I, I would just... Lord Stannis arrives first with Melisandre. Renly arrives soon after with Brienne. The brothers exchange taunts and threats to each other. <laughs> Renly whips out a peach. Stannis goes for his sword. You know, we, we've talked about the Baratheon brothers before, and it's a shame that we did. But it's almost, we, we gotta do another, we just have to do, like, one more podcast, it's, just one more time, just on the It's so on, entertaining. On these guys. Lady Captain tries to get them to cooperate, but they will not listen. Stannis even tells her that Rob is a traitor and he will have his stake too. <laughs> but that's because that's because Catelyn fucking Catelyn says some bad. Right, well, like, she insults him. She uh, she just she she couldn't keep your mouth shut. If you were my sons, I'd dash your heads together yeah. and lock you in room until you remembered you were brothers. And Stannis is like, "Whoa, don't worry about it. You're your sons now." Yeah, she's like, okay, yeah, you don't say that shit to Stannis. Renly tells Stannis that if he surrenders, he can have Storm's End. Stannis refuses to receive what is his by rights. <laughs> um, Catelyn points out that Stannis is not the rightful king either and learns about Cersei's incest from Stannis telling her that, yeah, well, Joffrey's not Robert's son. Lord Stannis first became suspicious. He went to John Arryn because he felt the accusation coming from his own mouth to Robert would not be believed. Catelyn is inclined to believe him, but Renly continues to think it is but a story. Renly pulls out a peach and eats it, threatening and mocking Stannis as he does. <laughs> oh, then Stannis, Stannis draws out Lightbringer, which glows brightly. He tells Renly he will give him until the morning to strike his banners. If he does, he can keep Storm's End and his small council seat, and he will even be named his heir until he has a son. If he does not, he will die. Renly doesn't believe this. He has Stannis greatly outnumbered. He flaunts his power by naming many of the great houses that have joined him. Tyrell, Rowan, Tarly, Karen, Tarth, Penrose, Fossaway, Hightower, Oakheart, Florent. <laughs> that's, that's the salt in the wound, because Florent, his wife is a Florent. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Sandra tells him to look to his sins at, in the park. I remember that. I remember that, like, I felt that that was like, I don't know, Renly, this is going to be a little tough, I think. The sodomy, Renly. Renly and Catelyn return to Renly's camp. It's smaller now because he left his foot at Bitterbridge, and he dashed to Storm's End with his horse. <laughs> Ugh, bad move. They return to his tent where his bannermen wait. Lord Mathis tells him, just leave Stannis here to siege the castle, like whatever. Sir Courtney Penrose is strongly provisioned, and the castle is too strong to storm. 
Lord Randall Tarley counters that Stannis is a danger that should be dealt with before he grows stronger. Good thinking on Randall Tarley's part. The others agree. Renly decides to face him on the morrow. Catelyn asks leave to return to River Run and her son. Renly refuses. He wants her to observe the coming battle and to report to Rob firsthand what happens to those who oppose him. Lord Mathis will command the center, Lord Bryce the left, and Renly himself the right. Lord Estamont will lead the reserve. Several others clamor for the honor of leading the van, but Renly gives that honor to Loras. Brienne will carry Renly's banner beside him. She protests being sent from Renly's side and asks the honor of at least dressing him for battle. <laughs> uh, Catelyn realizes that Brienne loves Renly. Catelyn asks for leave to pray at a nearby sept. Renly grants the request. So she goes to pray at the sept, and it's the next chapter, Catelyn Ford, which is two chapters away. You get Sansa three in between it. She prays at the sept, reflects on many subjects, muses on her mother, who died in childbirth, along with her newborn son. Catelyn realizes that she believes the Lannister children are incestuous based on all the evidence and believes that's why Bran was pushed off the tower. He must have seen something. And I'm going to stop right there. She's coming off all this stuff now, that which definitely appears that a lot of this stuff has to do with, you, you would think, Cersei and Jamie. You would think yeah. <laughs> there ain't one time in these Catelyn chapters where she thinks, well, maybe I shouldn't have arrested Tyrion. Yeah, right? <laughs> no oh my god, Dude, that's a good point. Never once, so she's like, oh, man, really maybe. botched that up, I got, you know. Yeah. She never puts anything together. And I think a lot of people are like this where they don't see their own flaws. Maybe a lot of people aren't so reflective where they look back on decisions they've made and realize the damage those decisions have caused. But these are people, maybe like you and I, but these are people that have, like, full-time jobs. They got to pay a mortgage. They got to pay rent. They got to pay their car insurance. You know, they have other shit to worry about and think about, so they're not going back on their life and recounting every mistake they've made. Whereas Catelyn is a noble lady, so she literally has no job. She's got nothing to do but think. And she seems, I mean, based on this chapter, she seems like a very observant, a very perceptive, a very, not foresight, but she can see ramifications of certain things. And even in this chapter, I don't think it says it here in the summary, but even in this chapter, she identifies with Cersei to a certain extent, saying that regardless of who the father is, those are Cersei's children, and she'll defend them to the death. And would she do any different? And she decides that no, she wouldn't. So Cersei doesn't want her children to die, so Cersei will be reasonable about mm -hmm. things. Little does she know. If she's able to understand all of that, how can she not look back at a decision she made like, like a few weeks ago and realize all the fucking horrible things that have come to pass because of it? And she still has an opportunity to make right those decisions that she's made. And you know what? I'm saying that, and maybe that's what she tries to do, because she returns to Renly's tent, and she tries one last effort to convince Renly to not fucking fight his brother, to not kill each other, to come together, and to defeat the Lannisters. But Renly's like, it's too late. And she's like, yeah, but what if Joffrey... He's like, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. At this point, all that matters is who is the strongest king, and that's me. Fucking Renly Baratheon, baby. Renly insists on waiting until dawn, because that's when Stannis expects him, and he does not want to win through treachery. He also orders that Stannis' corpse not be desecrated. <laughs> <laughs> He's expecting an arsenal. A blowout win. Yeah. Lord Randall asks what to do if Stannis yields, and Mathis says that's unlikely, considering his obstinacy at the siege of Storm's End during Robert's Rebellion. Renly agrees and tells how the master-at-arms, Sir Gawain Wilde, and three other knights had tried to sneak out of the castle and were caught by Stannis. He decided to hurl them over the walls with a catapult and already had Gawain strapped down <laughs> when Mace Crest had convinced him that they might eventually have to eat their dead and there's no point in wasting <laughs> good meat. <laughs> oh, man. After the two lords leave, Catelyn makes her last-ditch effort. She tells Renly of Bran's accident, the implications tells Renly that he, Stannis, and Rob should set aside their crowns and call a great council to prove the incest and choose a new king. Renly does not like the idea at all. He's about to say more when a shadow enters the room and slits his throat. I think in the show it stabbed him through the, through the, the chest, chest of right? the heart yeah. yeah. Uh, Brienne holds him as he dies. Sir Emmon and Sir Robar come rushing in. Sir Emmon attacks Brienne immediately. With two men-at-arms, Sir Robar hesitates and Catelyn pleads with him, swearing Brienne's innocence and asserting that it was Stannis who did it somehow. Sir Robar agrees and holds the others at bay. 
Catelyn stuns Sir Emmon with a brazier. She and Brienne escape out the back of the tent. <laughs> Catelyn tells Brienne about the shadow and swears she could feel Stannis' presence inside the tent. Brienne swears she will kill him. They return to Catelyn's escort, and Catelyn tells Hallis to prepare to ride. Sir Wendell and Sir Perwin form up beside her, and she tells Brienne to take a horse and come with them. And that's the end for King Renly. We've talked about this chat before. You may as well ask it again. Did you like the use of shadow magic here? This goes, I think, hand in hand a little bit into me thinking that Stannis was a villain. I mean, as yeah. much as you can say that Stannis had the rightful claim, this was kind of a cheat. Yeah. This, this was, you know, this was this was a Ric Flair move. Oh, this total Ric Flair heel move. And you know what? What's bad about it too is I think as a reader, and it's kind of tough because when I read these, but I'll say it again. I read the, I saw the show already. You know, so I kind of knew that things were happening. Yeah. You know, you, you still get Charlie lost when you do, you know, reading it. You still, in your own head, you're almost cheated. Not only did Stannis cheat to win, but you're almost cheated at maybe a good battle. Yeah. You know, how would he win this fight? Cheats. Yeah, you get the, you get all the setup, the build up, and then it's... It kind of backfires on Stannis because Stannis thought, okay, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to get, a, you know, I'll probably get at least 70% of his men. I'll, I'll be a little, a little honest. I'm sure some people won't go along with me. But, you know, like, all those great houses I thought that would come to my side didn't. No, they're like, fuck Stannis. If anything, it drives them to the side of the Lannisters. It does backfire on Stannis. Although, there's no way he would have beat Renly. But I think the important thing about that chapter is that may be the most righteous Catelyn Stark chapter that we get. Even though she probably should have thought of her own mistakes, her own decisions. Mm -hmm. It's still the most thoughtful and the most righteous we see Catelyn Stark throughout this entire series. I'd go as far as to say she did the right thing, or what she thought was the right thing, as much as she could do it in that chapter. Catelyn 5. The party's discovered by Frey Outriders. Martin Rivers is in command because Sir Brendan and the Outriders went with Rob to the west. Sir Edmure holds River Run. They tell her about Rob's victories. They tell her about Tywin's march. Rob is now raiding throughout the Westerlands, and his other lieutenants are all over the Westerlands also. Lord Rickard and Galbart, uh, Lady Mage has captured thousands of cattle. Great John has seized the gold mines at Castamir. Later that night, Brienne comes to Catelyn and asks for leave to depart. She wants to find and kill Stannis. Catelyn manages to convince her that she would just be throwing her life away. Brienne decides to serve Lady Catelyn instead. Catelyn accepts her oath. They begin their ride back to River Run. They cross a ford guarded by Malister men and later come across the Blackwood camp where Lucas takes his leave. She sees another camp full of pipers, Darius, and pages and realizes that Edmure has called the banners again and means to do battle with Tywin. As they approach River Run, they see some Lannisters hanging from the walls. Edmure rides out to greet Catelyn. He says that Sir Courtney Penrose has sent birds promising allegiance to any king that will lift Stannis' siege. He fears for Edric Storm, Robert's bastard. Stannis has offered to let the garrison go free unharmed if they deliver Edric into his custody. Catelyn asked about the hanged men, and Edmure explains that they came with Sir Cleos and tried to free Jaime. One of them killed two guards with his bare hands while another picked the lock of Jaime's cell. Another one was a mummer and impersonated Sir Edmure to get three guards to open the gates. The plot failed because Edmure was actually <laughs> whoring outside the castle. <laughs> when they saw him returning, they raised the alarm. Jamie got hold of a sword. He killed a knight and a squire, seriously wounded another. He is now in the black cells and chained to the wall. Those who aided him were hung. Sir Cleos, though he claimed to have no knowledge of the plan, was locked in Jamie's old tower. Edmure took in a ton of small folk because they were afraid. <laughs> Catelyn thinks it's just more malice to feed if there's a siege. <laughs> She thinks Edmure has a soft heart, but an even softer head. Oh, jeez. It's brutal. <laughs> Rob commanded that she be sent to the twins when she arrived, but she says she's staying. She asks Edmure of his battle plans, and he says that they will talk in the godswood. He tells her that he will have 8,000 foot and 3,000 horse when all his might has gathered. He plans to guard the fords to prevent Tywin crossing. At the same time, he will have Roos and his 10,000 augmented by Sir Helmand Tolhar's garrison that Edmure recalled from the twins. They'll retake Harren Hall while Tywin's marching and leave Tywin trapped between two armies, three when Rob returns. It's actually not a bad plan. Catelyn's not comfortable that Edmure recalled the garrison at the Twins, which was there to ensure Lord Walder's loyalty, but Edmure says that he has already proved it many times over and that Stevron died for Rob. Stevron being Lord Walder's first heir. Ryman Frey, Black Walder Frey are fighting in Rob's army in the west. Rob is going to marry one of Walder's brood. 
and Lord Roos has already done so. And this is the first time that we learn that Lord Roos has taken a Freyda wife. And yeah, it's not exactly a red flag, but... Strange. Yeah, and Catelyn hadn't realized it. He's confident his plan will work. Catelyn thinks it would be wiser to just let him through. She goes to see her father, who's confused. He thinks Catelyn is Lysa. He tells her that Marion John is for the best, and that she should never mention that wretched stripling again. I guess referring to either... Littlefinger? Littlefinger, or maybe the baby, I don't know. Catelyn wonders who Hoster could be referring to, and thinks it must be a hedge knight or singer, some other lowborn individual. So yeah, he was referring to Littlefinger. Maester Vyman says the end will come soon. And then she goes to see Eddard's bones and sends them back north. The thing is, Catelyn isn't really... She's not really making any decisions in A Clash of Kings. She makes one. It's all it takes. The biggest one of all. It's all it takes. Let me say, a lot of the stuff in this book that you can say causes a lot of harm is just her not listening to Robin going back north. Right. If she would have done that, she couldn't have freed Jamie. Right, exactly. It's her meddling that she doesn't she doesn't listen to the, her own son, who's who is, who is the king. I mean, I, almost she gets like lost. She feels as if like, hey, they pronounce Rob the king, but since he's my son, he's young. I'll just consider myself the queen. Yeah, she's like so power hungry. She's like, I didn't listen to your fucking father. You think I'm going to listen to you? But another thing, if she had gone back to Winterfell, a little what if is Theon successful in taking Winterfell? If she's there. Good question. She's got the foresight here to think that Edmure should just let Tywin pass. Mm -hmm. She's not, like, great at Warcraft, obviously. She's a noble lady, but she's smarter than Bran. She's definitely smarter than Sir Roderick, who she left as Castellan. I think it's less likely that Theon's successful if Catelyn's there. Then again... She could have died. Well, yes. she could have died or, or, or be a hostage. If, if Theon is successful while she's there, I don't think he'd kill her, but she's a good hostage for him. <laughs> Rob, come back to mommy. <laughs> yeah. Rob's like, oh, man, guys, I gotta, I gotta go back to Winterfell, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so Catelyn's six. And this is really just a observation of the battle. And I don't know that this battle has a specific name. But Edmure leads his men off out of River Run to do battle with Lord Tywin. He left a small garrison of young, old, and wounded, led by Sir Desmond, to defend the castle. Brienne asks what they must do now. Catelyn responds that they will do their duty. Okay, sure. You're going to do your duty. Right on. Catelyn has always done her duty. Okay, right. Which may be why she was Lord Hoster's favorite child. Yeah, okay, you're just out of touch with reality here. She ends up praying in the sept for hours. Maester Vyman receives a raven from Lord Elwood stating that Sir Courtney is dead and that Storm's End has declared for Stannis. Catelyn says that Rob should be told of this and asks where he is. Vyman reports that he was marching for the crag, the seat of House to Westerling. Sir Desmond Squire reports that the Lannisters have reached the river. Catelyn goes to the battlements and she sees 50 Lannister scouts flying the purple unicorn of House Brax. Malister men hold the fords. A brief skirmish, Lannisters withdraw. There is another attempt at the ford later that night, but it is held again. Brienne says that Tywin is probing for a weakness and will try to force a crossing if he cannot find one. The next morning, Catelyn's wine sent to Sir Cleos to loosen him up for questioning. A writer comes with a message from Lord Jason Malister. They tried to force a crossing at another ford, but were turned aside with heavy losses. They also repelled an attack further upstream. That evening, she visits Sir Cleos and asks him about the peace terms he brought. Catelyn is particularly interested in Tyrion's Ugh. promise. <laughs> Tyrion's promise to exchange to Arya and Sansa for Jaime. She asks after her daughters and discovers that Cleos never saw Arya. Five days later, Catelyn learns that Tywin launched his major assault two days before he tried to force a crossing at a dozen different fords. A couple of his men were captured. Sir Adam Marbrand made three attempts at one ford, but was finally forced to retreat. At Stone Mill, Sir Gregor led the fiercest assault, and a few of his men briefly gained the other side, but the reserves were committed, and he was forced to withdraw. Lord Tywin is now moving southeast and appears to be in retreat. Great celebration is held that night, but Catelyn is worried. She consults a map and sees that if Tywin is heading southeast, he has probably already reached the headwaters of the Blackwater, and we know what happens from there. Kind of odd that Catelyn seems to be like all-knowing about what eventually happens and to be worried about it. Almost as though George is painting her as a master at Warcraft. Um, I do remember that chapter being pretty cool as far as 
the battles going on at night, the surprise attacks, never knowing when the next attack was going to come. Now, just to go back a little bit on the uh, Arya Brienne thing. Sure. Cleos was honest, at least I believe he was honest in there, he said he didn't see Arya. Wouldn't that be a red flag? Well, yeah, red flag, like maybe... She's not here, maybe they don't have her or something, or maybe she's dead. And Yeah. You know, I'm sure if they said that she was dead, I'm sure that uh, she'd still do a one-for-one trade with Sansa for Jane, oh, because it's, you know, it's even. <sighs> if Sansa was dead and they just had, like, her the scalp of her hair, she'd probably make the trade. <laughs> But Rob, you don't understand. It's her hair, her lovely hair. All right, so here we go. Catelyn Seven. Bum, bum, bum. And actually, this is another chapter. You know what? Not for nothing, but I think pound for pound, Catelyn's chapters, there's less of them in The Clash of Kings, but they're, they're better. That last chapter was entertaining just because of the battles. This chapter I fucking love because it's the first time we see Jamie in forever, and he's so intriguing in this chapter. We get the parlay chapter. The Renly chapter. We get a big time chapters from Catelyn in A Clash of Kings. So yeah, she's not making the same decisions until now. But we do get major events in her chapters. Which she's not so much a part of as she is observing. Catelyn and Brienne eat alone in the Great Hall. Catelyn's really upset because Theon has taken Winterfell. And she's learned that Bran and Rickon are dead. May Sir Vyman received the word from Sir Roderick who is marching to retake Winterfell. Catelyn tells Brienne she's torn by grief and despair. She talks of her daughters and how she wants to kill Theon and all the Lannisters. She tells Brienne she sent wine to Jaime and bids Brienne to come with her to the dungeons at midnight. She goes to see Hoster, but he is asleep. She tells Maester Vyman to go join in the celebration and then sits with her father for hours until Brienne comes to tell her it is midnight. They go to the dungeons where she leaves Brienne to see that she is not disturbed and she enters Jaime's cell. Jaime has not touched the wine. He has not been allowed to shave since his capture, and he has a thick yellow beard and long, dirty hair. He is arrogant at first, but just as Catelyn is about to leave, he says he will cooperate. He agrees to tell her what she wants to know in exchange for imp- information on what is happening in Westeros. He admits to fathering Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen, and to flinging Bran from a window. <laughs> what does she say? To kill him? And he's like, well, I, I really throw children from windows for them to live. Whatever the fuck he said, he's funny. <laughs> she asks him about the assassination attempt on Bran, and he says, The Lannisters are innocent. Catelyn tells him of the dagger and how Tyrion won it for Peter, but Jamie says that Tyrion never bets against him. He did remember the dagger changing hands, though, because Robert showed it to him afterwards as he mocked Jamie. He talks of Ares and Brandon Stark. Brandon was on his way to River Run to marry Catelyn when he heard that Lyanna had been taken by Rhaegar. He rode into the Red Keep with Ethan Glover, Jeffrey Malister, Kyle Royce, Elbert Aaron shouting for Rhaegar to come out and die. <laughs> I can never get enough of that, dude. <laughs> Sound bites. Imagine being like Ethan Glover or Jeffrey Ballister and Brett is like, come out and die, Rhaegar. You're like, oh, man, what did we get involved with? Why did we follow this guy here? <laughs> Rhaegar was not there. Ares had them all arrested for treason. Their fathers were summoned to answer the charges and then executed along with their sons, save for Ethan. Lord Rickard demanded trial by combat and Ares granted his request, declaring fire to be the champion of House Targaryen, and having Rickard cooked in his armor. Brandon was bound around his throat, a cord attached to a Tyroshi device, and he was made to watch with his longsword just out of reach. He strangled himself trying to free... I can't get enough of that either. <laughs> yes, strangling yourself, you <laughs> fucking idiot. No, I'm God, I'm burning. I'm burning. Jamie notes the irony that he is loved by one for a kindness he never did and reviled by so many for his finest act. He's very vague about that. We don't find out what that is until Storm of Swords with Brienne in the uh, bath. Well and truly drunk, he begins insulting Catelyn and Eddard. <laughs> Catelyn calls Brienne and asks for his sword. Did you think that she killed Jamie? Well, I can't say no. It's in the show. So, in that regards, yeah, I knew he lived. Could you see, had you not seen the show, could you see... Could I see it? Yeah. Okay. The way it was set up, especially the way that Jamie was kind of like mocking Catelyn and, you know, bringing up John and, you know, and all that. I can see Catelyn being like, sword. I think Jamie was, I think Jamie was expecting it too. Like, this is when Jamie's still a minor character. So if he had been killed there, he would have ended up being a minor character who caused a lot of damage in Game of Thrones with Ned, but you don't really know him too well. And it would have been a shame because his character is so intriguing in this chapter. And 
I, for one, as much as I didn't like Jamie, even though I found him intriguing, I still didn't like him. When I opened Storm of Swords and I got past the prologue and I saw Jamie, it was a surprise for me. I didn't know that Jamie became a point of view character. And the fact that we were going to get inside his head now, I was just so psyched for it. I guess it's a side note. It's really got nothing to do with Catelyn, but I find it interesting. The anger and the, I don't know if I'd go so far as say hatred for Eddard that Jamie has. It's interesting that at this point in Game of Thrones, at least, he's very much like Eddard Stark. Or trying, I wouldn't say he's much like Eddard Stark. He's trying to be like Eddard Stark. With that move in uh, Season 7 at Highgarden, out of Rob Stark's playbook, and that scene with Cersei at the end, that was like a, that's like a Ned move. So all the anger and, I guess, hatred he has for the Starks early on in the Song of Ice and Fire, he's taking cues from them in the endgame. Do you think Jamie has redeemed himself? No, I, I, I still think it just builds and builds and builds with him throughout the story to finally redeem himself. Are you, are you saying like right now? I'm saying as of, I guess Game of Thrones is the best way to go. As of the end of Season 7, him leaving Cersei to go join Jon and Daenerys and his brother in the North, do you think he's redeemed himself for what he did in the first season? I, I guess not completely. Okay. I, I think maybe he still have to look at what he does when he sees Bran. Right. Uh, I think that to be very key. That's interesting. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, they, they'll see each other this season, for sure. Yeah, definitely. You would definitely think. He's going to be like, Lord Stark, I can never begin to apologize for what I did. You know, give this whole big apology, and Bridget's just going to be like, hey. <laughs> and I still think he's going to do something with John. Yeah. Ugh, dude, I can't wait for these callbacks. Bran and Jamie, um, John and Ar- John and Arya, John and Bran. Even from the pilot episode, from the first couple of chapters of Game of Thrones, all these relationships that are split up: Catelyn and John, Jamie and Bran, Arya and John, uh, Jamie and John. How about Jamie and Danny meeting? They had that showdown, you know, on the battlefield, but they didn't really meet yet. He was trying to end the war. No, it was he was going for it. Yeah. It was a dumb scene that was. Yeah, he goes into war. He's not going to die with all that armor on. <laughs> yeah, I hated that. But don't worry. Later on, we're still going to make this unbelievable. <laughs> Brand versus Arya. Where a woman who's two feet taller, weighs about 150 pounds more, is all of a sudden going to get bested by a girl with a little needle sword. I think that episode was directed by Ryan Johnson. <laughs> Probably was. <laughs> um, that's it for, for Catelyn in A Clash of Kings. We don't know exactly what she does until A Storm of Swords. Right. But you still got to count the decision. The action is credited to A Clash of Kings. Does this trump everything else she's done? What's worse, her releasing Jamie or her taking Tyrion at the end of the crossroads? <sighs> that is a good question. I don't know. I mean, you, you can make arguments on both sides. I will say, you know, like you made the mistake of arresting Tyrion, but you still have time throughout this war to make up for that mistake and keep yourself out of trouble. It's like a quarterback who throws one interception for a touchdown. Okay, but the game is still still tight, still close, but just don't make any other, any other right. bad decisions. Well, guess what? I'm going to throw into double coverage for another touchdown for coming back. Doubles down. Yeah. What, it's third and three right now in side field goal range? Nope. I'm going to go for the end zone and bang, picked over to turn for a touchdown. That's what she does here. She can't help herself. You can make the excuse... As far as Tyrion, that she had, she had you know poor intel. Yeah. But then she's given the opportunity to end it. If she had let Tyrion go, if Tyrion tried to reason with her, if she listened, I'm sure Tyrion would have smoothed things over as best he could. But she doubles down. With Jaime, you can make the excuse that she just found out Brandon and Rickon were dead. She wants to see her daughters. Okay, fine. If that's your excuse, it's not good enough. But if that's your excuse, okay, I can understand a mom doing that. But this thing is so well thought out that it's almost like she doubles down on it. It's not like she's like, you know what? I'm going to free Jamie. And she just goes and frees him. And she's like, I hope he makes it. She plans it out, sending Brienne, getting him drunk, not telling the guards. She planned for a way to get him to King's Landing. Which one's more destructive? Taking Tyrion or freeing Jamie? Freeing Jamie. Yeah. Granted, they wouldn't be in that situation if she hadn't taken Tyrion. And granted, taking Tyrion directly and directly led to Ned being beheaded, but that was 
the plan for Cersei anyway was to eliminate Ned if he wouldn't play ball. So she's kind of off the hook there, not really, but at least as far as that leading directly to the death of a Stark. Whereas Jamie exposes not just House Stark, but House Tully to retribution from Tywin. That's their protection. That's their, we said it a million times, that's their get out of jail free card. That's their trump card is Jamie. She just gives it up, not even for a definite trade-off. It's not like she brings him and trades and she has Sansa immediately. She has to then still hope that Tyrion does the right thing, that Sansa makes it, that Arya's alive. It's a shot in the dark, and she gave up so much to take it. And it's not like then in Storm of Swords, she doesn't have her wits about her. She's still the same old Catelyn in Storm of Swords, so this wasn't like an act of passion where she lost control. She was meticulous about this, methodical, and she's still the same old Catelyn when we pick up with her again. With all that in mind, this is the worst decision that she makes. This spells the end for House Stark, with whom she is the Lady of Winterfell, and for House Tully, with whom she was the Lady of River Run. It's so self-destructive, too. It leads to her death. And I don't know what she thought would happen. No foresight at all. Can't stand her. Hate her. Despise her. If she didn't treat John as bad as she treated him, would you hate her as much for making this decision? Maybe she wouldn't be number one. She'd still be top five. Mm-hmm. I think Sansa would be number one then. <laughs> Gotta have a Tully in there. Life is not complete without having a Tully hated. In Sansa's defense, she's not going to release Jamie. No, I don't think she would. No. But you never know what these Tullys think of when they have the, <laughs> when their minds are up against it. With their backs to the wall, they're the most da- <laughs> dangerous species in Westeros. You already saw what she can do when she wants to lie for a Lannister. Thanks for listening. You can find us, the Westeros and Companion, thepriencesthatwerepromised.com. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash thepromisedprinces. Follow us on Twitter at princespromised. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud. We've got a YouTube channel. Search The Princes That Were Promised. Subscribe. Leave a review. We will speak with you guys next week and wrap up. Catelyn Tully. John, always a pleasure. We'll talk to you guys later. Bum 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 b